Ready to go. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'll call the meeting order to order at 7.04. Uh, the first order of business is approving the November minutes. Has everybody had a chance to take a look at what Dave wrote? I, I would just like to make one correction, Bob, if you agree. Uh, I'd like to be considered an excused absence at that meeting, and I wasn't listed. Okay, um, I'll we'll tell uh, we'll tell David. Uh, do we have a motion? I move that we accept the minutes. I'll second. second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Aye. Now we'll turn the meeting over to David and let him make his presentation. Dave, uh, Dave Medjoya is going to be showing up in the middle of this, so but, but go right ahead. All right. All right. So I'm just getting my presentation up. Everybody sees the screen? Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. So this is, it's good to see everybody again. Um, I, I hope the weather is, uh, is better than it was on Monday night, uh, at least how it appeared on TV for the Bills game. So with their 50 mile an hour wind gusts. But we're, we're uh, I've actually, been- David, yes, we're, we're yes. actually due to be getting 65 mile an hour wind gusts on Saturday. <laughs> that was just the preview, huh? Yeah, yeah. Very nice. I, I have to say I was at the game and uh, still depressed from the, the outcome. So let's not, let's not go there, David. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would have all been worth it if they had won, right? Great, so uh, th this is an, an interim update. Um, I, I'm not done yet, although I've made great progress since uh, we last spoke. Uh, pretty much finished the, the, the data gathering and, uh, and research part of what I'm doing. Uh, I've got a couple more stakeholder interviews left to do. And then uh, I've started diving into the comparable community stuff as well. And uh, you know, my aim, as I, I've said, is to have a, a draft report ready um, a few days in advance of next month's EDAB meeting. And then next month we'll, you know, I'll, I'll be presenting, you know, findings and recommendations. So this is kind of an interim update, just sort of summing up uh, where, where I'm at and uh, what some of the preliminary things that I'm finding are and some, some comments. Uh, I'll go ahead with the presentation. If you have questions along the way, please just uh, speak up. So I'm going for it. So just a, a quick review of where, where we're at. Um, done, the data, as I said, the data collection and stakeholder outreach is mostly done. I'm uh, you know, well in process <coughs> on the market conditions report, more, more than 50% done with it, getting into the best practices review. And uh, then we'll have the final report, as I said, uh, at least the draft final report by next month. So that's where we're at. All right, quick. Uh, rundown here of the data analysis and just some preliminary things. I don't think anything in here will be earth shattering. You know, these are all things that that I, I didn't find anything terribly surprising in looking at the data as uh, compares to what I know about uh, the market and what uh, people have been saying in, in my discussions with everybody. So just uh, the, the starting point on this whole process was reviewing the 2018 comp plan and just some kind of longer term historical notes here. It's interesting that you know, most of the growth in Grand Island happened between 1950 and 1980. And uh, the growth rate has really slowed down since then. And it's only been just in the last few years that you've seen residential and commercial construction resuming again. So sort of a lot of the issues you're facing in the community, I think are rooted in the fact that a lot of your development, particularly on the commercial side, is 40 to 60 years old now and uh, need, needs to be modernized and upgraded. Um, no surprise here, very high dependence on the residential tax base. You know, 80% of your taxable value is residential, which puts a, a huge burden on homeowners and it limits the capacity of the community to invest in economic development projects. So that, that was true three years ago, it's still true now. Um, little land available for new commercial development. There, there really isn't that much land in town that's zoned for commercial use. And so there's going to need to be a focus on redevelopment if you're looking at business opportunities in the community. 
um, the boulevard is the, the core of your community in so many ways. And, and many of the key recommendations of the plan are focused around the boulevard and not just the town center. So there's the town center, but then there's also the industrial area to the north, the, um, the uh, tourism and, and uh, amusement area just north of town center as well. And then the commercial corridor to the south and really just a lot of different things that need to happen along the corridor. Um, interesting one to me is that the plan, you know, that I don't know how many of you were involved in it or have gone deep into the, the community survey part of it, but it was interesting that, that people get that the housing stock of the community needs to diversify. People were overwhelmingly in support of that. However, they weren't really uh, in support of apartments. So people like different kinds of housing besides single family, as long as they don't scream apartment. So uh, that that's an interesting thing to, to dance around. And I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that point later because uh, there are some successful developments that have, I would say very effectively uh, walked that tightrope and provided a good product without having them come out and say, yes, these are apartments. All right, so looking at some of the data, um, and these are things I presented last time, so I, I won't spend too much time on it. The town did add about a thousand people between the 2010 and the 2020 census, growth rate of about 5%, which was faster than Erie County or the Buffalo metro area, but it actually trailed the city of Buffalo. So it's interesting to see how patterns are shifting within the region. That 2010 to 2020 was the first decade that the city of Buffalo added population since the 1940s. So it's uh, things are different. Um, look, looking at the island itself and where our population growth is happening, um, very little growth has happened west of the thruway. So um, th there's been a, a little bit of growth in this area, um, you know, some in the a little, actually less in the northern part of, of the island in the sandy beach and north half of the boulevard. Most of the growth has been over here, some new residential subdivisions. And then also uh, track 73.04 includes the south part of the boulevard. So it does take in more hand in point than some of the other new residential developments are. So you have more households added that at, in terms of growth rate, your household growth rate exceeded your population growth rate. So the average household size dropped. I would say that's to be expected with all the apartments that have been added. That makes sense. Um, your age profile in, in town is shifting. The, the median age went up slightly, but it wasn't a uniform increase in the older population. There, there was a significant increase in the share uh, of residents age 65 and older, but there was also a significant increase in the age 25 to 34 population. And I would say that this is also a function of the kinds of housing being built. There are some you know, starter home subdivisions um, on the eastern side of the island off of Whitehaven. And then, of course, the apartments have drawn in a lot of young professionals to the community. So, you know, you've seen growth in those areas, but we've actually seen a decline in age 55 to 64 and 45 to 54 in terms of the share of population. And uh, I think this is one that, that should give everyone pause is uh, children as a share of the town's population has dropped uh, pretty substantially from 2010 to 2020, or rather to 2019, and young adults has really fallen off, uh, people in the age 15 to 24 group. So uh, the community is getting older, you're getting some single young professionals, but you're not getting as many families with children as you did in the past. <coughs> this chart shows, uh, excuse me, job change for the entire Buffalo metro area by month going back to 2010. And it's pretty remarkable, sort of the, the straight line increase over time. The seasonal variations were, you know, you could almost set your watch to it until COVID happened. And in the two months from February to April 2020, the region lost 21% of its jobs. You did almost have a V-shaped recovery, but then it uh, did some funky things, you know, went up and down again with uh, the, the different waves of the pandemic. And as of October 2021, um, you're still down in the region about 9% from where the job base was pre-COVID. So the damage was significant and, and, it, and the effects are still lingering. Um, this chart, you, it's a little hard to read at this scale, but the, the bottom bar for each category is how many jobs were there in 2010. 
the middle bar is 2019 and the top bar is 2020. So you can see in every industry, there was a significant drop off in employment from 2019 to 2020. Retail and hospitality was the most affected. Healthcare and education lost a little bit, but it's actually still above where it was in 2010. So even with uh, this, you know, 9% fall off from, from pre-pandemic, the health and healthcare and education sector has continued to do well in the region and the manufacturing sector has held its own as well. Um, the unemployment spike in the region was temporary. It went up faster than the New York state average, but it also came down faster. And your regional unemployment rate uh, got back below 5% as, October, uh, sorry, as of October for the first time since prior to COVID. So that's very good news that uh, Western New York is outperforming the state in terms of getting people back to work. All right, so now we get focused on Grand Island and uh, really taking a look at what makes your local economy unique and uh, have stand apart, not just from the region, but from how you used to be. So manufacturing was and still is the, the backbone of your economy, you know, specifically the two large uh, biomedical manufacturers on the west side of the island. Um, they, they alone employ 1,700 people and comprise a very large share of this 35%. Um, overall, the, the town added 1,500 jobs from 2010 to 2019, which is very significant. You've seen a lot of job growth on the island and it's becoming less of a bedroom community and you know getting more of an employment base. And back to that health and education, the share of that sector of, as part of your local economy has more than doubled over the past decade. There's a few reasons for that. I mean, that, that, that includes uh, early childhood education. And obviously you have a number of new daycare facilities that have opened on the island. So that's one factor. You've also had a number of medical practices open and uh, the, the urgent care facility that's under construction right now, I think is going to be a huge boost for that sector. That alone isn't adding that many jobs, but just having that as kind of a, a beachhead on the island is probably going to lead to continued growth in the healthcare sector. Um, the concern here though, is the professional and business services sector, the office using jobs in town. There's been a dramatic drop off in the last decade in that sector. Um, I don't have any particular knowledge of, a, of office based businesses that have moved or closed. I don't know if any of you do, um, but you know, if you have any, any color to add to that, I would appreciate it because that's what the numbers say, but I'm not sure if that's actually the case. <laughs> any, any thoughts on that issue? Uh, Canon design for one. Yeah, that's right. Okay. They had a data. I don't know, a hundred maybe. I don't know. We'd have to go back and look, but mm -hmm. I would also say that the old uh, Dunlop slash Occidental building, which is now the Holiday Inn Express, was a pretty substantial office yes. uh, back in the day, and that kind of closed up and went dormant, and then was repurposed into a hotel. But I mean, there That's was right. there was several hundred people there, mm -hmm. and that, but that was way before two thousand and nine. Was it nine? I don't know when the date was. They they shut down. Oh, it, yeah, it was long. It was probably around two thousand. In fact, I think they were shut down by two before two thousand. Oh, were they? Okay. Yeah. yeah I guess I'm older time. than I thought. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how it's counted, but we had, um, you know, there was that pharmaceutical sales company. I mean, it, all those Probably little count as, as office. Yeah. So yeah. a lot of those, a lot of those probably add up, you know, mm -hmm. 20 here, 50 there, a hundred something there, probably. But yeah, I, I, would guess that, I would guess that Canon is far and away the, the biggest, the biggest result of that. I mean, the, the biggest cost. Yeah, of they're, that. they're pretty big. So that makes sense. Yep. Okay. Was there any and, yes. Is there any uh, possibility that maybe in 2009 the, that maybe part of the pharmaceutical companies were considered office and now they're considered something different? There's always a possibility. I mean, this is done by NAICS code and okay. it's whatever the company reports itself as. You know, if they're, okay. if they're in sales, they're probably reporting as, as you know, professional business services. 
as opposed mm -hmm. to manufacturing. Um, you know, health and education is pretty much health care. It's not, uh, you know, pharma or biotech. Those usually fall under either manufacturing or professional services. Okay. Uh, and I will note that, that these numbers were pre-2020. They, they aren't reported at the town level in real time as they are with the, the current employment statistics that I showed you for the region. So uh, in terms of, of numbers and, you know, actual government data, we don't have that at the at the local level post pandemic, but I think it's probably fair to say that your retail and hospitality sector took its lumps in the pandemic, and um, some of the other sectors probably have done quite a bit better. Manufacturing, you know, in driving by the the, the facilities over there, they seem to be very busy, and I know they're hiring because I uh, I saw a giant billboard on the 290 saying as much, so. It, it seems like things are good. Um, as a note, I, I have reached out to Thermo Fisher um, as one of the stakeholder interviews, but have not heard back from them. So I might try to find a different person there if uh, the person whose name I was given doesn't respond because I would like to talk with them. What was the All name? Right, so, sorry? What name did you have? Oh, I'll have to flip through my notes here. Give me a second. It is... Mary McCormick. Okay. Okay. There might be somebody else I can come up with. Let me look. Okay. And if there's someone from Fresenius as well, that would be good. I'd like to talk okay. to both of them. Okay. Okay. Excellent. All right. So um, commuting stats, you know, again, no, no surprise to you that this is, you know, it's a bit of an abstract graphic here, but the circle is people who live and work on the island. The arrow out is out commuters. The arrow in is in commuters. So you've got about 10,600 employed residents of Grand Island. And every day, at least pre-pandemic, 9,000 of them commuted off the island. So 85%. And more than half of those were going to either Buffalo or Amherst. And almost all of them were headed south. Uh, only 8% worked in uh, Niagara Falls or the town of Niagara. So it's a lot of traffic and it's all going one way. Um, what's really interesting at, you know, to that point about, you know, you have different people living here than working here. I showed you back here. This is the profile of people who work on the island. This one's the profile of people who live on the island. And you can see that, you know, health and education and professional and business services, half of your, your resident population works in those two sectors. By comparison, those two sectors only make up 32% of your jobs. So you've got a lot of you know, professionals in you know, office-based industries and healthcare industries who are commuting off the island each day and manufacturing only 11% of your residents work in that. So the vast majority of people working at Thermo and Fresenius are commuting in from somewhere else. On that point with manufacturing, I found this one fascinating. Uh, these are the uh, long range employment forecasts that uh, GBNRTC does for um, every municipality in the region. And they, in my view, are undercounting, you know, what, what to expect both on population and on employment. They're showing very, very modest growth. So modest, in fact, that uh, in reality, as of 2020, your actual population has already exceeded what they were projecting for 2050. So take that with a grain of salt. However, if you look at employment, their forecasts were showing growth in every employment sector in town, except for manufacturing. And they were showing a massive loss of manufacturing jobs, close to 40% of your manufacturing base. So if you just block off that left side of the screen and look at the right, there's strong potential for growth. You know, other sectors is mostly industrial using space uh, logistics, warehouse, transportation, utilities, et cetera. So, you know, th there, there's been a lot of demand on the island for flex space. Some new projects are doing quite well. Uh, we talked about healthcare and education. There is forecasted increase, a forecasted increase in office using jobs and a slight gain, but not much in retail. So the message is if you want to shore up your economy, you know, do everything you can to keep those uh, two major manufacturers going and keep them happy because they're such a huge part of your economy. And uh, the long range forecast for manufacturing is not good at the regional level. 
Hey, I had a question. <clears throat> yes. With uh, with with since uh, the pandemic, you know, a lot of the companies are are uh, transitioning to remote work. Yep. And then you know, so you're gonna. I, I wonder if that is there any way you could track that? You know, because you, you saw growth in your office space, but you know, you, I would think that might be different now with what we're seeing as a as a need for um, mm -hmm. employees. You know that they're that they're preferring. You know, you're, you're seeing. Um, survey result after survey result is that, you know, people are referring it, you know, at least a hybrid schedule, if not, you know, fully remote, you know, does that, does, can you, is there any data points to, to support that? Or is it, is, you know, your paycheck obviously comes from, you know. Right. Where your where the, employer is. Yeah. So where the I, employer I, I is. put, I put together some data that were, you know, well, Dave and Joy, you can, you can speak to how helpful they were. But um, this was early in the pandemic. I put data together for Amherst on mobility, you know, that basically tracks cell phone pings by day and by zip code, or rather by census tract. And that was useful in Amherst where they have so many census tracts, but you've only got three in Grand Island. Well, four now, but pre-2020, it was only three. So I don't know how helpful that will be. It just shows how, you know, how many people are, are, are giving off their cell phone pings on each day. Uh, traffic counts would be one way to do it. But honestly, I think the, the, the more logical way to do it is rather than try to collect the data is just look at these industries and look at rates of remote work. Uh, the only sector among all of these that really has a high percentage of remote workers is office-based jobs. You know, if you're in manufacturing, you got to go to the plant every day. If you're in healthcare or education, you got to go to the building where your patients or your students are. Well, at least now that students are back in school, and you know, in the you know distribution and light industrial world, you got to physically have your hands on the product and, and be in that space. You know, that's generalizing a bit. There are some opportunities for remote work, but the office-based sectors, professional and business services. That's where you see the remote jobs. And going back to this slide, you just don't have a lot of those jobs in the town. Now, turning this around, because you have so many people who live in town and work in that field, what you do have is a lot of people who are home during the day now who didn't used to be. So that's more opportunity for spending money during the day. Yeah, that's, would you call that like a capture rate then? You know, of those, of those individuals now staying on the island more than they would. So that would, you're, you know, you would have more of an opportunity to, you know, um, you know, you should see a spike in business at tops, for example, you know, that they're not, you know, they're, they're not going off the island as much, you know, to work, you know, they're, you might see increases in retail here, you know, as they're, as they're staying at home, you know. I, I, I would think so. Uh, also, I would see, I would expect to see an increase in, in uh, business for lunch at restaurants. So I don't know if that's the case or not, but that, that is something that, that would be associated with more people working from home. Real quick um, question, David, yeah. uh, going back to that circle where the uh, on and off the island. Oh, this or, one. Yep. Of that 4105, you said most of the people that were going off were going into those two areas to the south. For right. the people coming in, does it look like most of them are also coming from the south, or is there some percentage coming from the north? They're, they're coming from all over. I mean, I okay. have the town by town stats in a table. I don't remember offhand, but but it, my memory of it was that it wasn't quite as concentrated as uh, okay. you know so many people going to Buffalo or Amherst. There are a lot of people from the town and city of Tonawanda, as you might expect, and a lot from Niagara Falls as well but I don't think any one jurisdiction dominates. Okay. I was just curious to see if there um, was anything about, you know, a predominant area or not uh, that they, those folks were coming from. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I don't believe so. I know it's not Grand Island, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, moving on now to the housing market. So, uh, th this trend line is pretty consistent. And, you know, when the pandemic happens here, the, the ups and downs in the market don't appear to be any different. So, you know, the housing market has just chugged right along. You've seen median prices rising at a 
steady rate and it's been you know pretty strong rate the median home price has grown an average of 6.2 percent a year from 2015 through 2020 and it's about 33 percent above the regional median and that stayed consistent over time as well so it's just it just keeps on going and the pandemic didn't really do much to it uh, what it has done is knock the inventory down at the region substantially. So th this is for all of Erie County. In 2018, the um, qu third quarter inventory was about 2,000 homes available for sale. 2020, it was about 1,000. This year, it's about 800. And the months of available inventory right now is at 1.1 months. Two years ago, it was at 2.5, or sorry, 2.7 months. So you've seen an enormous drop off in the amount of homes available for sale and prices keep going up, which is making it harder and harder for people to find housing on the island or really in the whole region. Um, I, I looked at every county in New York State, by the way, I believe Erie County was the third lowest in the state in terms of months of inventory. And the other two were also, you know, for, you know, West, Rochester or points west. So that the whole of Western New York is really seeing an inventory crunch and a need for more development. Yeah, can you go back to that slide before the highs? Yes. Mm -hmm. This one? Got it. Okay. I'm just capturing it to give to our assessor. Oh, I'm going to email this to you. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I, I emailed it to Dave and Joy already. So, Dave, you can share it with everybody. Yeah, we have a link. Dave, you're going to leave it in okay. that Dropbox. I, I didn't know if you were making yeah. any. Um, yeah, yeah we, it'll, it'll we stay could, there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can, we'll send it out to everybody after the meeting because there were a few people that couldn't make it that wanted to see it. So it'll be easier yeah. for them to and, come and full disclosure here, um, I don't have personal access to the MLS. Uh, Jerry Andalina was nice enough to pull this for me. So if you ever need that data, you can ask her or another local realtor. Thank you. Everybody, everybody's going to see a higher tax bill next year because of this <laughs> slide. So that's what's going on. <laughs> No. Well, that's why you need more commercial development. Yes, it is. All right. So um, th this is looking re regionally at the oops, at the commercial markets, sort of lumping them all together. Uh, the industrial market in Western New York is uh, at this point, I think bulletproof is the word for it. You have you know low vacancy, strong rent growth. Um, the, the rent change over the past 12 months has been over 6% and vacancy has been coming down. It's way lower than the national average and it just keeps turning right along. Um, office is a problem nationally, you know, to the point about the pandemic, you know, higher vacancy, lower rent growth, retail struggled a bit, but uh, the regional multifamily market has been doing very well as well with, uh, this is across all of Metro Buffalo, the vacancy rate for every rental unit in the region is now 3%, which is essentially 0% because with monthly turnover, you have some amount of the units vacant at any given time. So, you know, basically there are no apartments available to rent anywhere in Western New York and rents have been going up as a result. Uh, this is taking a look now at retail leakage. This is a little bit of an abstract concept, but if you imagine everyone who lives on Grand Island and all the buying power that all the households have. And you then you compare that with the actual amount of retail sales that exist on your businesses. Um, this is tracked by Esri, which is uh, the, the company that makes the GIS products. So they, they have some pretty robust information out there. Um, it's not always 100% accurate, but I think it feels right um, for Grand Island. And essentially, if, it, if there's a a, a line going to the right that means you have leakage from your market, that you have more demand of spending than you do supply of retail businesses. The only two categories where you have a surplus, where you have more people spending money on the island than you have spent some money off the island is motor vehicles and parts. So you can thank your, uh, your local car dealers for that. You have many of them. And curiously, electronics and appliance stores. I'm not sure why that is exactly, but... Um, that's, that's what the data are saying. But if you look at general merchandise, this would be your department stores and your, your Walmarts of the world. Huge amount of leakage, $35 million a year of spending by Grand Island residents in this category is done somewhere else. 
um, clothing, 25 million a year. We can forget gas stations, you don't need those. Um, restaurants, almost $20 million a year. Curiously though, uh, for, for all of the reports about uh, people going off the island to shop at Wegmans, uh, food and beverage stores was not one of the bigger categories of leakage. Uh, you know, the, the tops does very well. I actually spoke to uh, Benderson uh, just earlier today, finally got a call back from them. And they say it's one of the stronger top stores they have. And it's been very consistent over time. And it's, you know, you have a captive market. So people might want to shop elsewhere, but in general, they don't <laughs> because it's there. And then you also have some smaller uh, convenience stores on the island as well that capture some of that. But, you know, the, 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 the larger message is there's a lot of demand that could be captured here, but national retailers aren't interested because you just have the island population, you don't have the traffic counts, et cetera. So there are opportunities here for entrepreneurs to capture some of this demand. All right, so no more numbers. Now we're gonna do pictures. So unless anyone has questions about the numbers. All right, so uh, this is kind of a, a, a photo essay of sorts of my, my time in Grand Island taking a look around and some impressions of the physical development patterns of the community and how that relates to the market and opportunities. So uh, starting with gateways, which I know is a huge priority oops, of the community is uh, right now, and you all know this, it's not pretty. You know, you, you have your, your Southern gateway is kind of this visual jumble. You see the bridges in the background and you know it's not very pedestrian friendly. You don't have much in the way of planting. You have this very lonely bus shelter here, but it's not a very hospitable, hospitable place if you're not going 50 miles an hour in a car. Um, this site, I, I, I don't wanna pick on too many individual sites, but this site to me seems like a huge opportunity to do something. And I know you have difficult owners for some of these properties along the boulevard but this is the site uh, you know, right at the, the roundabout over here. That is the gateway. You come over the bridge, you come up to the roundabout, this is what you see. And that's clearly not the message the town is trying to deliver to the world about who Grand Island is. So just something to know. Um, speaking of picking on properties, um, commercial districts, you know, the I don't know who said it, but it's something I've repeated a lot in my career, are the window through which the world views your community. So you obviously have a beautiful community with lots of you know, wonderful water front end areas and beautiful residential neighborhoods and parks and trails. But to the average person driving up the boulevard, this is their impression of Grand Island. It looks sad, it looks depressing. It looks like a place you don't wanna spend a lot of time in. And it's not just Grand Island Plaza, although that's the easiest uh, poster child to pick on. It's some of the older motels. It's not Kelly's, I'm not picking on them. And, and the other you know, underutilized commercial sites. And the town really needs to you know, pay attention to this as part of you know, the, the vision for the future. All right, now let's do some good news that because you haven't been overwhelmed by, by national chains, you, know, you are losing retail dollars. But as a result of that, you've been able to maintain your local character and you know, keep businesses like Kelly's going and these are the things that make you special and they really need to be the things that you build your whole vision around in my view. Uh, new development. So you, you do have, as I was saying before, some good examples of new investment and development um, in, in spite of the vacancies here. Uh, it's a nice looking shopping center uh, that, that Mazer has built here. And you, know, you have good businesses in it. And my discussion with him, he has held these open on purpose because he doesn't want restaurants in these middle spaces. He wants them to fit in more with the, the personal and healthcare uses that are already there. So, you know, more importantly, you have investments like this that are helping to build your commercial tax base, which, you know, to the point on residential burden is a huge issue in your community. Uh, you have had some good adaptive reuses, uh, an old motel being turned into a residential development. I've heard varied stories about, you know, if it's actually a good development, but it certainly looks nice from the outside and it certainly represents an investment in the community and there are worse things. And uh, the point with this is with 
construction costs being as high as they are right now, adaptive reuse projects like this make a lot of sense. And you certainly have lots of, op of opportunities in Grand Island for this type of adaptive reuse development, particularly for residential. Uh, I'd mentioned Flex before. This is a brand new Flex building on Grand Island Boulevard that is actually getting higher rents than much of the retail space on the boulevard. Um, you know, these are not fancy spaces. I actually got to go inside. You, you go in and it's a big open space behind the garage door. Each one has a small office space and, you know, the developer is willing to build out more office space if they want, but it's mostly open space. But what it is, is a brand new attractive building with high ceilings, the, you know, ground level dock doors and climate control. And for a lot of, you know, these warehouse distribution, small manufacturers, entrepreneurial type businesses, this is exactly what they're looking for. And this kind of product, you know, might not be sexy, but it's filling a need and it's, you know, it's adding to your commercial tax base and getting pretty good rents. All right, so tourism, obviously the, the good is what you see here. You have, you know, world-class outdoor and ecotourism facilities, some of the best paddling, uh, biking and birding opportunities in Western New York. All of you know that because you live there, but it might not be the best known thing in the broader world. Um, just a few more pictures of, of what you've got. You know, the West River Trail is a truly unique asset. And, you know, may, maybe I'm a little different because I don't, I don't live there, but, you know, to me, it's pretty cool to be riding on this trail knowing you're looking at Canada over here. That's an experience people who don't live near the border would love to have, I would think. Um, on, you know, sort of the opportunity side of tourism is the amusement park, the former Fantasy Island. You know, it was a critical anchor and a critical part of your community. Certainly the new owner has said they're intending to bring it back to life and do all of, all of those things. We'll see, I've reached out to them and gotten radio silence. So I don't know exactly what they're saying to the community or if you know, there's um, any way I could be put in touch with them by, by one of you, but I'd love the opportunity to speak with them. Uh, what stands out to me is that you have all of this land along the boulevard, you know, for all of the, the angst about, uh, where did it go, about Grand Island Plaza and, you know, why can't we do something with it? If you just turn around and look across the street, you're looking at, uh, at this. So maybe there's an opportunity for the new owners to actually do something with this frontage. You know, it's not per se in your town center, but it's adjacent to it. And there could be an opportunity to be some to do some sort of nice development that reinforces the community's vision for the boulevard. Uh, you've got the state welcome center, which looks really nice, but it's kind of a white elephant. And uh, I know there have been attempts pre-COVID to activate it and program it more, but it's a great asset, but it, it, there needs to be ways to have it work for the community better than it does currently. Um, your campgrounds are a critically important piece of what you've got, especially because you don't have much in the way of lodging. You only have uh, you know, two chain hotels and a couple of older motels. And really the campgrounds are, are sort of the backbone of it and bring people back year after year after year. Uh, here's where, where I spent my, my vacation in Grand Island, <laughs> the, the Radisson. And, you know, it's, it's not a pleasant experience. You know, it's dated. It feels kind of scary because there's almost nobody there. And while it does have the meeting space for indoor events, it's too far from the other attractions on the island. And it doesn't offer the quality experience that you want people to have in order to attract visitors in from outside the region. I will say with, with the Radisson though, you kind of step back and see what's around it. You know, you have the riverfront, you're right at a marina and a nature preserve and a golf course. And there's a lot of ingredients there where it could be a nice place to, to take a trip, but there really needs to be more thought about how it all fits together. And it doesn't seem like there has been up until now. Um, the key thing with tourism is the need for support services outfitters, restaurants, guides, and specialty retailers, things that tourists can do and see and spend money while they're there. Uh, as far as I know, the only place to rent a bike on the island is at Blue Water Marina. 
and uh, they sort of uh, do it grudgingly from, from my discussion with them because people have asked for it. Um, they're not a bike shop. They can't repair bikes. They're you know way down in Ferry Village, not the middle of the island. And there's clearly an opportunity for a bike shop and bike rental facility to open elsewhere. Um, I won't say anything in, in this setting, but one of the people I talked to in my stakeholder interviews indicated that there may actually be a bike shop coming to the island, which is great news. So I, I won't say anything more now unless you all know about it already, but I don't think you do. All right, so let's talk about residential. So I mentioned before your, your residential neighborhoods are one of your greatest assets. You have you know, very nice, stable, mature, single family neighborhoods um, that kind of give the character of the island that islanders all know about. That's the good part, the, the not so good part. If you look at some of the new housing being built, this is a new subdivision off of Whitehaven. Uh, it doesn't look so great. You know, you sort of contrast it with the, the mature trees and the, and the sidewalks and, you know, the well, the well kept yards. You know, I know this is under construction, but, you know, the, the construction quality doesn't look all that good. You're not seeing much in the way of street trees. And this to me does not seem like the kind of neighborhood that's going to age well. Uh, this is another neighborhood uh, nearby off of Whitehaven. Same story. It just it doesn't it doesn't say Grand Island. It doesn't feel like a high quality development, and it's not going to age well, in in my view. Uh, there are things you can do about this. You know, in, in your design standards and your development uh, codes, you can require that things are are built to look nicer and and feel better than this. And you know, builders will build what what they're allowed to. And if you're not going to regulate uh, the appearance of new residential developments, this is often what you're going to get, the uh, kind of the, the entry level. So just something to think about. Um, Heron Point has been a game changer for the community, love it or hate it. It's been very successful. They're getting uh, rents of uh, as high as $1.60 a square foot, which is very competitive at the regional level. Um, it's brought in a lot of young professionals to the community, a lot of new energy, a lot of more disposable income. And as you all know, they're now doing phase two and there's several other multifamily developments that are in the wings behind it, knowing how this has been successful. However, it's purely residential. You gotta, for the most part, drive in and drive out. It's not right near other things around the town center area. And there really needs to be an emphasis if you're going to achieve your town center vision to make sure that new multifamily developments are better connected to commercial and civic uses. Um, the River Town project across the street wants to do that. I guess you have to wait and see if they actually deliver on it in their in their plans and their execution. But uh, I hope I'm not stepping out of line here. But my thought on that is, you know, that's a great step. And it could be something that really sets the bar for future development in Grand Island. Uh, this is something I mentioned earlier in the context of the, the survey and the comp plan, people saying they want different kinds of housing, but they don't want apartments. Well, Hidden Meadow Trail has been an unqualified success. These are rental uh, attached units. They're one level living with uh, some have one car garages, some have two car garages. And these units are running for as much as $2,400, $2,500 a month for a three bedroom unit. So very high rents, you know, very well kept little community, but you know, they, they look like houses, not apartments. And I get the, the sense the community is much more accepting of this than some people are of, of this. So there are certainly more opportunities for this scale and type of residential development. Uh, similarly, Nottingham, uh, another recent residential development. They, they're built as townhouses, but they're all rentals. So effectively these are the same in the market as apartment units, but they don't look like apartments. Okay, so we're getting near the end. I know I'm throwing a lot at you. I uh, just wanna quickly talk through sort of some initial impressions of the five best practice communities we agreed on at the last meeting. Um, if, just to refresh everyone's memory, you know, what we agreed on. Uh, were, were these five, uh, Gross Eel, Michigan, near Detroit, which is sort of your long lost twin, Seneca Falls, New York, on Cayuga Lake, 
Cambridge, Maryland on the lower eastern shore, Monona, Wisconsin, which is uh, across Lake Monona from Madison, and Mashpee, Massachusetts, which is on Cape Cod and has uh, done a phenomenal job of turning a failed shopping center into a very, very attractive town center. So uh, the first thing I started with was let's take a look at the numbers and see how you stack up against these other communities. Um, so a lot of good information in here, which you all can, can study uh, later, but you know, Grand Island sort of falls in the middle in a lot of ways in terms of median income, you know, gross yield and uh, Mashpee are more affluent, the others a little bit less so. Um, you're in the middle on median age, um, you're, you're the biggest of all of the communities in terms of overall population, but not the most in terms of jobs. Uh, Cambridge it was an old manufacturing center and actually has retained some of that industrial base. And Monona actually is a regional retail center. So it actually has more jobs than people, even though it kind of appears to be a quiet suburb. But just sort of understanding from a demographic and economic standpoint, how you compare to these communities is a good place to start. Um, I haven't gotten into the talking to people in these communities yet or lessons learned, but just thought you could, you know, chew on each of them for, for a minute about, you know, how they're, they, they're like you and not like you. So Gros Eel, you know, this is how you get onto the island. It's a two lane bridge. There's another two lane bridge down the river. So it's not quite the same as your, you know, throughway coming through with the double bridges. It's a little bit more of a quaint experience and they've done a really nice job creating a walkable commercial district in an area that wasn't traditionally a downtown. Seneca Falls, I know some of you are familiar with already. You know, you've got the, the old mill and then nearby you've got, uh, you know, the Montezuma Wildlife Refuge and the State Park. And they've really done a great job retooling their economy around tourism um, instead of the historic economy and manufacturing. Uh, Cambridge, same story. It was a, a, a seafood canning town that lost most of its jobs in the 80s and has been dramatically remade as a heritage and nature tourism destination. Uh, Monona, which, you know, this view, it's not quite as, it, it's closer to Madison than you are to Buffalo, but it should seem semi-familiar to you. Uh, but they've done a really nice job of, you know, improving access on their waterfront. Um, they've, they've done a lot of investments in parks and public spaces and getting people to the water. I know that's a challenge in Grand Island because very little of the waterfront is privately owned and, and what's not privately owned is owned by the state. But, you know, in any case, you can see some nice examples of what communities do that can get to their waterfronts. And then Mashpee, um, you'll, you'll see more in the report about what it used to look like, but this is what it looks like now. So it was a 1960s shopping mall in the middle of a 19 acre parking lot. And it looks like this now. And the developer unfortunately just uh, pulled a proposal last week because they couldn't come to a consensus with the community, but they want to build five residential neighborhoods around it. So what they did is they tore down the shopping center, built these blocks and then left the parking around it. And now they're trying to fill in the parking with residential but it's a little bit more controversial than they would have hoped. So those are the communities that uh, we'll be diving into more. And by next month, we'll know a lot more about them and have some lessons to learn from each of them. So moving ahead, um, I'm finishing up the stakeholder interviews over the next week before Christmas, uh, aiming to com complete the review of best practices by January 7th, the first week of next year have the draft report ready to share with you prior to your, your next meeting, which I assume will be January 13th, and have a final report to you by the end of January. So, hold on one second, I will stop sharing. So thank you for your attention. I'm you know, happy to field comments or questions at this point, but uh, hopefully you can see where this is all going. Really appreciate all the work you've done up to this point in time. And um, I think your visual touring is um, impactful uh, to get the point across. So thank you for that. My one sure. question, were we talking about having the present, were we gonna invite town board members 
to that meeting for the presentation. I thought we talked about something about having them be included before the final report or am I misunderstanding or misremembering? Anybody, somebody? <laughs> I, I think um, I think they would be probably get more of an honest reaction out of it if they were there along with the public when it was presented. We could get yeah. a preemptive, but I don't know what well, do you think. Well, but uh, Martha, were you asking about the the January EDAB meeting? Because I, I'm anticipating doing a public presentation to the town board, most likely in February. Okay. And at that point, that would be the public involved. Um. I'm just wondering if before we have the public involved, if we want the town board to have a preview before that, rather than them seeing it at the same time, because what I'm hearing you say then is at the same time that the town board would see it, the public would be seeing it as well. Correct? Well, I mean, the, the town board would have the chance to review the document before a presentation. Yeah. But uh, I, I, don't have, I don't have an issue with with town board members sitting in on next month's EDAD meeting, if, if all of you don't. I will I will put it out there to see if anybody has interest. You know, okay. to, to me, it, it would be nice to have, I guess, a, them to get it first. However, I really don't think they're gonna change the outcome, you know? No, it's not about changing the outcome. I think because the town board, you know, um, showed enough investment in this project um, with, you know, being involved, uh, at least from a financial standpoint, um, in the beginning, I just, um, I would just like to give them the nod, at least the opportunity to see it before the public does. Um, not saying that it's a matter of their voice should change anything. But right. to me, it's just a sign of, of respect to give them the opportunity to, if they want to join, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong, but if the town board members are included, then this becomes a public meeting. And the public can listen to it in whatever form it is, whether it's a public meeting or whether it's a, a Zoom meeting. Technically, this is a public meeting. If it's somebody nice. wanted to, I'm just saying, if you, yeah. to, well, I understand, but there'll be more interest if if the town board members are sitting in listening to the discussion. Yeah, I, I wonder if it might make more sense to just invite the supervisor, and then I can brief other town board members offline if they would like that. Um, yeah, we just have to be careful with open meeting rules because if you get more than three of us involved. Then obviously right. we got that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Quorum stuff. Yes. Yes. And and then it's posted and then it's a public meeting. And then you're just basically doing it, uh, you know, a couple weeks early, you know, right. well, the other also you know, Pete, you know, you being the liaison to the, to the board, you know, I, you're, you're certainly free to share this presentation with. Oh, the yes, board. yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the also, thing, you know, thing. go ahead. Uh, the other thing we could do if we wanted is, uh, you know, take take the recording of our January 13th meeting and have Rhonda cull it down to just David's presentation and pass that on to the board members. I mean, that, that, yeah. That's that makes idea. it not a public meeting, but they will see exactly what we've seen. Uh, I mean, I don't have an issue inviting them to, to sit in with it, but I think you do have a, a can of worms with, uh, you know, with with some of the uh, the notifications and public meeting law. Mm -hmm. I like the recording option to be able to pare it down to David's presentation and then share that out. And if they choose to watch it beforehand, then they do. And if they don't, then they can wait for the public one. I mean, quite honestly, they could watch this presentation tomorrow. I mean, right. if Rhonda posted it, right. they could they could see everything we've seen the next yeah. day. Mm -hmm. So, and and you know, th this is 
probably two thirds of what will be in the report is what you just saw. You know, all that's missing is the, the best practices review and some, you know, and the findings and recommendations. You know, here's what you should do next. Obviously, that's the most important part. But, you know, this is all of the raw material that feeds into that. Yeah, I mean, Pete, you have the, uh, everybody does via email, you have a copy of what Dave presented. I mean, you don't have the context cool. of his narrative around each of the slides, but if anybody, you know, if any of the town board members want to thumb through it and have any questions, um, but I, I agree with everybody else that, uh, you know, they should, they could watch the recording of the 13th. We could provide them maybe the hard copy before any kind of further public meeting, but I mean, there's nothing overly controversial in here, right? I mean, I, we, we've yet to see, uh, we've yet to see Dave's uh, recommendations, but, um, you know, they're going to be provocative and maybe thoughtful, but I mean, it's not like he's going to say, you know, well, maybe you guys should plant some charges on the bridges and force everybody <laughs> to spend all their money on Grand Island versus all the leakage. But, you know, so, I mean, yeah. Yeah. So. I mean, and, and to your point, anybody could pick this meeting up tomorrow and watch it, right. you know, and, right. and maybe, maybe, maybe to that, I should, I should uh, encourage that for, for other board members who have interest, you know, mm -hmm. and just, and just me thinking, not not to put too many fingers in the pie, but I, I would really, really, I guess, value how our long range planning com committee commission, whatever they are, would would take a lot of this because I think, you know, a couple of things you, I've heard you say tonight <clears throat> are things that I've heard around the table for quite a long time, and uh, you know, well, and I, I, think I had a, I had a, an hour long discussion with Jim Sharp yesterday, so he's mm -hmm. he's heard a lot of it from me already. Good, good. I think it's important we keep that that dialogue going because I think you're you are really, I guess, solidifying a lot of the things that came out of that whole master plan. Well, you know, I think we wouldn't run into any issues. I mean, it would make the make our our screen a little bit larger with respect to the number of tiles of videos mm -hmm. that you'd scroll through. But we can, you know, I don't mind extending them an invocate, uh, invitation to, to view it on the thirteenth. Yeah. Yeah, and then, you know, I, after that, as I said, I, I I always had it in mind of making a presentation to the town board, you know, February or whenever it fits on the agenda. Um, mm -hmm. Is the town board meeting in person at this point, Pete? At this point? Yeah. So yeah. I'd, I'd be, I, I mean, I still have money in my budget for another trip, so I would be okay to do an in-person presentation at that point. Will you be staying at the Radisson? No. <laughs> oh, just a question. I'll, I'll stay at the Holiday Inn Express this time. It Give that a nicer. try, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Martha, um, maybe, maybe it wouldn't hurt to encourage the Long Range Planning uh, Committee or Commission, whatever, to, to, to view this as well, just to kind of understand sure. it. Sure. Absolutely. Kristen's had her hand raised. Hi, Kristen. Hey, everybody. Uh, David, thank you for your uh, presentation. I got just a, a few questions. Um, could you provide us the list of who you have conducted interviews with so far? Um, it sounds like you're planning to wrap up in like a week and a half or so, but um, I'd be curious to see who you've, um, you know, who you have met with. You mentioned a couple of um, businesses that you haven't yet met with, you know, maybe we can help facilitate those. Um, yeah. I was wondering if also if you if you had met with um, Visit Buffalo Niagara or Destination Niagara people, the tourism people. Uh, that that that's another one I've not yet been able to. So here's a list of everyone I have successfully met with so far. Could you uh, send that by it. email? Yeah, I can I can do that. Thank and you. then uh, these are folks um, that I've tried to meet with and, and haven't succeeded with. Uh, getting them to call me back yet. Um, I've left Cindy Kincaid at Visit Buffalo and Niagara four messages and haven't heard back. Um, so yeah, I know I, somebody I know over there. Do. I can I can make a call. But yeah, if you give us that okay. list, then we can. Yeah, but with with, with, with Destination Niagara, you know, they only rec they only represent Niagara County. So I can certainly talk to them, but they're not going to do any favors for Grand Island because their job is to represent hotels in Niagara County. Okay. Um, and then in terms of um, how this is presented too, will, 
and I know we were just talking about it and I'm not sure exactly where we landed, but will EDAB have an opportunity to see this before it is presented to the yes, town board? My, my, my intention, well, my intention is to deliver all of you a draft a couple of days in advance of January 13th to give you a chance to read the whole report and uh, you know take notes and ask questions. And then I'll make a presentation of it, but then you'll also you'll have had a chance to read the whole report. And then I and that'll just be a draft. And then the final report will be what gets delivered to the town board by the end of the month. Okay. And how much of, like I know obviously like this is sort of like little midway point or a little past midway point in the process, but when in terms of like how you're um, the recommendations and that, how much is going to be focused on ecotourism? Um, it's hard to say. I mean, that, that would be one of the things I highlight. I mean, there, there's only three key areas of recommendations. Um, one would be ecotourism. One would be, you know, placemaking and town center development. And one would be other types of business attraction and development. So it's, it's really one of the three pillars of, uh, of, of the recommendations, but I wouldn't say that it gets any more or less weight than the other two because they're all important. Okay, yeah, I was just asking, the grant money that we got is geared towards ecotourism and agritourism. Um, mm -hmm. But I just wanted to, you know, kind of see how that was gonna be weighted in. Well, you know, let, let me ask this on, on agritourism. I haven't been given any contacts who are in, are in the agro agritourism world. And, you know, in my driving around, I didn't come across any places that were obviously agritourism destinations. Uh, is there something I missed? We do have an ag advisory board. Uh, we may be able to put you in touch with the people that had that up. We did have a farmer's market here um, yep. And there is, um, uh, we do have some local residents that are involved in a small scale. So uh, we can think about it and, and get back to you on that. Yeah, and I know when, it, when I met with uh, the Taste New York person at the visitor center, you know, they are intending to bring back the farmer's market there. But I don't know if that's the best location for Grand Island to have it at because it's kind of off the beaten path for, for most of the town. I think, David, if you want, I sit on the Ag and, ag and Farmland Protection Plan through Grand Island, and now yep. we're um, an advisory board. And Sheila, who's our chairwoman, I can give you her information. And maybe even just a 10 minute conversation, she could tell you how, yeah. what we're working on through, you know, working on zoning and whatnot and all that. Okay, She's, yeah, I'd be, ha I'd be happy to talk with her. But okay. you know, back to my question, I, it sounds like there aren't any active agritourism businesses running in the town, unless I'm missing something. Well, on a large scale, no. On a small scale, there's quite a few. Hmm. Okay. Um, Sheila will be the best to tell you that. I sit on that board as not a farmer. I'm one of the residents. Um, there's three kind of like at larges that sit on that board. Um, right, right, and it's a newer board. Right now, we're going through the zone, revamping the zoning and stuff. Anyways, but Sheila knows everything that's the sh the movers and the shakers of that on the island. So she'd be, I know she'd be more than happy to talk to you for ten or fifteen minutes if you'd like. Okay, sure. Yeah, if you can. I'll email you the information and I'll contact her to let her okay. heads up. Thanks, David. Good. Yep. So, Dave, uh, this is Roger. Um, you didn't uh, mention, you meant you kind of skimmed by the state parks. I was just wondering in terms of uh, Beaver Island Park and your conversations with Cindy Montana, yeah. what opportunities you might see there, uh, if any, uh, what are the positives, the negatives? Um, we do hold the Paddles Up event there. We've held other events there. So yeah. I'm just, in terms of ecotourism, I was just wondering if you saw any great opportunities for that as being one of the anchors. 
Yeah, most definitely. And obviously I shared some pictures taken from Beaver Island. Um, you know, it's a beautiful spot, a lot of potential there, but the, the limiting factor, you know, I keep coming back to this is the, the visitor infrastructure that, you know, as of right now, it's a nice place for people to day trip to. And, but if you're having a major festival there, and I know we've talked about that with, with the ecotourism group, you know, you don't have very many hotel rooms on the island and what you do have um, isn't the best face of the community. And you really just, the, the, there's, a, there's a limit to the size of an event you can hold unless you're going to be able to add more capacity to the overall tourism industry with restaurants, with shopping, with lodging, with the whole tourist experience. And that's really what I'm focused on. You know, the, the state park is great. You know, Cindy certainly has a lot of things she's aiming to do there. You know, want, wanting to add camping at the state park would help. But I, I was a little, you know, I a little bit surprised, you know, sort of asking about the kinds of lodging she'd like to do there. And her thought is it's a state park. People who go there don't want to spend very much money. So it's not going to be high end. So I'm not sure that that really it is in line with the vision for ecotourism if you're talking about you know a, a cheap no, that's the wrong word inexpensive state park campground okay there was mention by somebody i can't remember who it was but it when we had that uh, meeting at the uh, parks office yeah about a research facility mm -hmm. of some sort and it seems to me i don't i don't know how real that is if that could actually happen and who's uh, been working on that. But uh, at other places I've uh, visited, well, my own old hometown, Noah has a big facility there and that's a big draw for people. And um, I'm just wondering if you, if we had the right kind of research facility, I'm, I'm trying to think where else, See, I guess Cedar Key, Florida, is another place that I've seen stuff like that right there on the waterfront. And uh, it's a big draw. Yeah, I mean, the, the, those sorts of things are what you know what you might call an economic development lightning strikes, that there, there's some reason why, they, why they're there. And it's not because of the effort of the local community to recruit that, you know, that, you know, the, the research center has some affinity for that place, or there's a connection from a university to it. And I'm not saying it can't happen in Grand Island, but I have no earthly idea how you can, you know, put that into a, a document like this and say you should target it because how do you even know what to target? Yeah. Did you get a feeling from the stakeholders you interviewed that there was much enthusiasm for, for the kind of economic development that you think that we need to do to upgrade? Yeah, most definitely. You know, you start talking about, you know, the, the trails and the connectivity and you know, being able to ride on a bike from Beaver Island to a nice town center, that really all fits into the same narrative. So I, I think did they, they get, can all work together. Did you get a sense that our chamber or our business community was invested at all or really interested or what it well, would I, take? I, I, can't, I can't speak for the entire membership of the chamber, but uh, certainly uh, Eric Feeblecorn was very much behind the vision and he's, still the president there. So I assume he speaks for the broader uh, percentage of the membership. Yeah, I guess what I'm asking is, how does St. Clair, Michigan, or some of these other places get off the dime and actually make the kind of development that they did? What, what kind of a commitment does it take from a, a business community like Grand Island and That's a population. A and yes, I, said, I, I, haven't, <laughs> I haven't talked to the comparable communities yet, but that is one of the central questions I'm asking was, you know, where did the vision come from? I mean, I, I know in a couple of the places already, you know, in Mashpee, it came from the property owner, from a visionary developer who said, I can do better with this. He, you know, was, he was the second generation owner of the property. He was a younger person at the time and you know had a new fresh vision for the place so sometimes it comes from that in uh monona it was city driven they had a very aggressive you know city driven investment in place making and beautification you know improving the pedestrian environment investing in public parks and water access so that was more of a top-down thing there are different models for it 
but again, I haven't talked directly to these folks yet, so I don't have the whole story. So that'll be part of the recommendations we'll be making. That's right, yes. Okay, thank you. And David, could I, could I mention uh, three of the things that you said this evening and then ask a question, if I could? Okay. Uh, you mentioned that there is little land for commercial use. You said there is opposition to apartments. And you said there's a need to ensure major manufacturing can continue to grow and thrive. Have you factored in the role of a small active group in Grand Island that opposes any kind of commercial growth? I certainly saw all of the signs driving around that uh, used to say no Amazon warehouse and now just say no warehouse. So well, they much. say no whatever is next. Exactly. But I'm asking, have you, you know, factored I, that in? Because it does have an influence, and there's been a lot of opportunities that have that have gone dead because of because of the residents in the small group of of people. Here's what I'll say to that. You know, I I'm going on the survey from the comp plan. You know, I, I'm not surveying hundreds of people or holding public hearings as part of this contract. That's not what I was hired to do. Um, and also I want to make clear, this is not a comprehensive economic development strategy. This is a market analysis that's looking at opportunities. Now that said, the opposition is real. There's no question about it. My sense is that it's a loud minority that, you know, I don't know if it's 10%, 20%, 30% of people on the island who are absolutely against any type of growth and progress. But you start looking at, you know, some of the, the new people who moved on to the island, you know, you have a net increase of a thousand residents. I have some numbers on, on mobility, um, the number of people who move each year. And it's about a, every year, about a thousand new people move to the island and a thousand people move out. So, you know, it's the longtime residents like most of you who get involved in, in civic affairs but the vast majority of people just go about their business, do their jobs, raise their kids, and aren't involved in this stuff and don't show up to public hearings. And you know what, what I've learned in years of doing this is it's really easy to get people to show up to a public meeting and say they're against something, but it's near impossible to get people to show up and say they're for something. Right, but that has to be factored in because they've been effective. Every well, time you talk may, about may, may, maybe so, major but, you know, that's the question is if the town has a vision and they want to, and, and you know, the, the broad consensus in the town is we want to implement this vision, it comes down to leadership, either at the political level or the business level or both, and say, we know there's opposition to it, but we're going to push forward anyway, and we're going to trust that, that people are going to, sh to show up and be in favor of it or we have to go organize people to show up and be in favor for it. You know, I, I if you know going in that 60%, 70% of the community is absolutely against something, then of course you don't push forward with it. That's, that's not how you do things. But if you are convinced that there's a broad swath of the community, the, you know, 60% or more people that want to have this town center, that want to, you know, keep developing new types of housing, that aren't stridently opposed to every type of industrial development, then you know the leadership just needs to say, okay, we believe in our vision and we trust that our community will support us if we go ahead with it. Easy well, for me to say, I'm not Pete. <laughs> I don't have to yeah, run for re-election. With the exception of Peter, your comment about leadership is absolutely correct. But with the exception of Peter, there's a lot of pandering among town leadership that will reinforce the negativity. So you're right, there needs to be the strong willed in the leadership to be able to see some of these things come to fruition. Otherwise, it's, it's just a discussion that goes nowhere. Well, you know, I, I like to think that the town board authorized the funding for this contract to hire me, which means they wanted to hear my opinion. So I'm going to provide my opinion. And if the town board chooses to put the study on the shelf and do nothing with it, that, that's their right. Well, I understand. Um, you Thank know, you. Bob, I'm gonna say this and, and don't think that I, that I look at things, you know, uh, 
or I don't look at things and I'm acting cavalier, but I've said this time and time again, that if it's a really good project and it's a really good fit, it finds its way through, you know, it, it, they always do it. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes you got to rip the bandaid off, but they make it, you know, projects that usually stall and falter and stuff. They do have some problems, you know, and yeah. we, you can't just say every economic, uh, you know, development opportunity is a good one. Um, but you, I, and thank you for the compliment, by the way, I do try to let all the cards play out before you look at it. Yeah, you, know, you do. So we do, we do get a lot of uh, uh, pushback right at the onset of just a simple discussion, which I think is wrong. I really think you should work through a project A to Z, look at the traffic, understand it, you know, before, before you say no, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, nobody should be saying no at the first look at a blueprint. I'm sorry. One more thing I'll add is that if it's a good project, to your point, Pete, if it's well planned, well thought out, well executed, even people that opposed it will two years from now say, oh, I, I've always supported that. Um, the, yeah. the, the community I live in, we have a you know very large and extraordinarily successful mixed use town center development called Avalon that uh, our current mayor opposed it when he was on the city council and stridently so saying it would be the worst thing that ever happened. And now all he does is talk about how great Avalon is. If you, if you go back through, <laughs> through town history, I mean, you should have seen the uprising when they wanted to build a bridge. You should have seen the uprising when they wanted to build the throughway. Um, you know, the world was going to end. The island was going to sink. Things as we know were going to end. And I couldn't even imagine living here without any of that stuff now. So at some point, somebody, you know, stood up and says, no, this is good for the long term. And we have to go there, you know? Yeah, well, it's, it's leadership. At some point, yep. somebody, yes, the West River Shoreline Trail, exactly. Mm -hmm. And now I would assume if you surveyed everyone on the island, 90% of the people would say it's great. I think the best truth to that would be in two years, let's try and make it into a road. <laughs> let's see how that goes. <laughs> it would be a great experiment, wouldn't it? And that's my twist of humor for tonight. <laughs> David, the only other, you know, I was thinking the other day, and I'm not trying to reinvent or, or readjust, you know, what you're doing, because I, 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 I'm, I'm in awe. You did a great job. Um, it seems like there is no large space to rent for events on the island. It seems to be so sporadic. Um, I know this because I'm trying to plan an inauguration and stuff with my group, and um, the spots are so limited and so sparsely available that it seems like we really missed the boat there. Well, I mean, are you not counting the Radisson? Well, you can count the Radisson, you can count Beaver Island, but then where do you go? Niagara you know, Falls. Right. You know, I'm, I'm talking about having a, you know, a venue. I mean, you can go to the Buffalo Launch Club, but there's, there's just not a lot of options. So, well, our schools are so overbooked. So that's hard. So all the community people, all the community groups fill out the little spaces that there are kind of within the town, but in order yeah. to hold an event anywhere. Yeah, you're right, Pete. Everything's very limited. I mean, that's why our chamber has, you know, their big event off the island with an island business owner. Yeah, that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of obscure that, that itself. With yeah. the comment about tourism infrastructure, because that's, that's part of it. Um, you know, you, Bigger cities aren't immune to it, or aren't immune to it either. I, I know Buffalo is trying to build a new convention center right now and struggling to make the case for it because, well, you have a convention center already. What do you need a new one for? Well, it's 40 years old. It's out of date. It's not big enough. We can't get the meetings we want to have. So, you know, it, it's something that needs to be discussed that you do have some places now, but this might be something where the town identifies a site and and says we want this to happen here and then puts out an rfp for it yeah and i've seen that done before i mean just just to have a boy scout meeting somewhere with you know 50 60 kids it seems like you gotta you have to plan it and hope for for availability and that stuff there's just so few opportunities and to jen's point again yeah. your 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 grand island chamber holds its main event every year off the island because there is nowhere here that can hold it and properly facilitate it so, and there's no indoor space for kids to hold events. 
if it's yeah. on an athletic level, there's so much, yeah. I, I can mean, talk so, about it for half an hour, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, just to the point of tourism, that to me is the base of tourism, you know? Well, I mean, it, it's one base of tourism. Yeah, There's right. a lot of different types. I mean, you already have a pretty robust tourist market locally, um, and it will be more so, you know, if and when the amusement park reopens. Mm -hmm. But it's not all sort of a cohesive experience. So maybe we need a big uh, uh, center in front of the old Fantasy Island there, huh? Where you can get married and go for a ride on the, the roller coaster. Well, I mean, in all seriousness, you know, that site, there's a lot of unused land on it. Mm -hmm. And my, you know, my understanding is that there were, you know, other parties that were interested in buying the land and, you know, not necessarily reopening it as an amusement park and doing something else with it. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens with this group, but, you know, I got to say my, my perfectly honest opinion, I think this might be bigger than they're capable of. Um, you know, just the, the, they're a startup group that, you know, I, I know they've done a nice job so far at Indiana Beach, but that's one place. Now they're trying to do two more at the same time. And I'm not sure that they're up to the job. Let's hope they are. Yeah. Um, just one brief question. Do you, when in doing these things or just within your, your history of work or whatnot, do you find that towns are putting in more design standards in to things like considering the, all those new developments you showed us with not one tree or, you know, new building, like, do you find that communities are getting tougher on their design standards? I know that's one thing you brought up. No question about it. And I, I think that the faster a community has been growing, the more likely they are to put design standards in to control things. I, I found this in a lot of communities in Western New York that you know, there's a sense that, well, we haven't been growing for so long, so we don't wanna do anything that's going to upset anyone who wants to build here. We wanna you know, let developers and builders do whatever they want. Grand Island doesn't have to do that. You're a desirable community. People want to be there. They wanna build there. They wanna live there. And you know, if you're not protecting the things that make you special, then what are you protecting? Mm -hmm. I completely agree, Dave. I think we can raise the bar. And nobody will nobody will balk at it one iota, and, yeah, and I, yeah, I think I, mean, I think a good you know, start is the, the, design standards for residential. Here's what I know about developers, and I, and I've been a developer, so I, I can speak to this. Developers will complain endlessly about you making them pay five hundred more dollars for something, and then they'll just turn around and charge the five hundred dollars to the customer. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't affect their bottom line at all. What yeah. they really want is predictability. They, Developers don't want to be tied up for years and, you know, put off and put off. They won't mind spending the money if they know up front, here's what we expect if you want to build here. So here are our standards. If you exceed these standards, you'll get approved. Right. And I, but I also think upping those standards influences future buildings or older, you know, properties that when, when you're upping those standards, sometimes I just feel like it spreads out, you know, it helps overall in everything, like our town center growing our main street. All right, thanks. If there's nothing else, then uh, thank you, David. Thanks to all of you. Um, thank you, you David. Have a great holiday season, and uh, I'll have more for you uh, in the new year. Looking forward to it. All right, good night. Thanks, Good night. Dave. Good night. Um, let's see, what's next on our list? David put this on here uh, for the officers. Officers, yeah. But well, I think it's, 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 David, well, it David, serves, one, a, David, serves one, a dual purpose, though. So. Before you start, would you do me a favor and fix those Venetian blinds behind you? And yeah, somebody I mean, with a little bit of OCD, that just looks terrible we're gonna let uh we'll let the next person that buys the house take care of all that stuff i'm not gonna worry about it <laughs> um yeah well again it just just serves a, it actually serves a dual purpose i think pete mentioned last meeting there were a few uh folks on the board who were expiring so um i think you know who you are if you want to be reappointed let pete know 
Um, you know, otherwise, you know, we've got <clears throat> at least one alternative that, you know, I'm not going to speak for, but, uh, you know, we could uh, slide that person into a uh, permanent spot if she wishes. The other thing is we have three officer positions. Um, there's a chair, a vice chair, and a secretary. Um, it could be a co-chair. Uh, there's a variety of things, you know, if anybody's interested in being an officer, um, you know, feel free to let us know. I won't be offended if I get uh, replaced, but, um, you know, what's... Uh, so you're, willing, you're willing, Dave, to do another term? <laughs> uh, I got to talk to... I, I have to talk to my co-chair about that, but it's just, you know, think about it. What, what I'm, I'm going to say something similar to what Dave said, except I will be offended if I have to do this again. <laughs> oh, no, no. You're doing it very well, Bob. I, I, have, I have no vote on this, but I, but, but I'll say that that conductivity through this project may may re very well be a good thing. Yeah, I, I don't I don't disagree with that. I think um, I can be talked into co-chairing one more year. Um, co-chairing, though. No, I think it worked well. Need a need a, a partner partner in crime on this one. And, you know, Roger, you know, Roger, I, I like the, I like the format in the last couple of minutes. I think you got it down. So. I think you, know, you did minutes. Well, well I, I did it based on your format from the previous meeting though. Cause you were excused last month. I know. So. I little, I, would it be, uh, would it be possible to make a motion to reelect our three officers for that? Not until, not until January, Bob. Yeah. But yeah, they, they always month. vote before January one. It's always been always been done at the January meeting. We'll do it at the January meeting. Yeah, Dave so we're, have, we're, Dave and I'll have to talk a little bit. Yeah, we're still we'll still co-chair in up to that January meeting, so we'll figure it out. And Pete, I said last month that I was happy to stay on if I was uh, welcome to stay on. So I don't know if you need anything more formal than that from me. Martha, you are always welcome in my world. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. I think formally you need to at least send an email to the town supervisor. I think okay. that, that's what we've always done in the past. That's probably best practice so it could be memorialized somewhere. Yeah. I'll send it to him and CC you, Pete. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. That'll work. Martha, are you an EDEB representative for Long Range or are you a citizen at large with Long Range? I'm a citizen at large. Um, I believe Mary has been our EDEB okay. representative. All right. And Mary is, uh, her term's coming up. And the last I talked to her, she had made up her mind what she's going to do. So if you're still on uh, Long Range planning, you could slide into the be the edab person was i it, wouldn't be able to be the community at large and the edab person you'd have to have somebody else um because i'm already uh community at large okay. so you'd have to have somebody else um be the representative martha is the keeper of the matrix all right we will yes. uh all right we'll cross that bridge when we come to it yeah <laughs> I, th I think the only other things around table i put a put a copy of the um said's document uh the survey that was sent to the town that we filled out and uh sent back it was it was fairly short um had some links uh, you know the town provided us with a with a good list of capital projects and it's really something that they'll analyze and study and put into their matrix um that there might be a possibility for some further follow-up but um that was that was completed in in a, within a couple of days of their deadline. So appreciate everybody's help on that. So Dave, is part of what ECIDA is supposed to be doing here, helping us with, let's just say uh, Dan Stedman has his Blue Water Marina thing down there. And, uh, and there may be other small businesses that we would like to promote. Um, do, since you know all about IDA funding, how, how do we how do we approach that so that some of these businesses that we want to see thrive or new ones come on here get access to um, IDA incentives? Well, yeah. Well, I guess I would need need to know what the matter of investment is. I mean, the one thing 
the one thing that's difficult is, you know, there typically isn't a lot of tax credits for those types of ventures, but they do have a number of loan funds and um, the, uh, uh, the rules are starting to relax on them a little bit. A lot of times there were a whole host of federal regulations that kind of tied their hands on, on, on payment terms, interest rates, um, you know, risk, you know, risk ratings and, and such. And they've been able to get a little bit more aggressive on that. I think as you saw in my comment there, it might not be a bad idea to have them um, at a future meeting just to make that connection. Cause I think there's a couple, there's a couple things going on there, right? It's okay. What, what can you do to help our small business? Maybe they, maybe they present in a, in a zoom meeting or at a chamber event or have something like that and have it, have them do it at least annually. Um, but at the same time, I think it's important, you know, they're out there talking to the major employers, you know, those manufacturing companies, um, and some of the some of the like that are that are in the industrial park, and you know I think it's important to keep the dialogue and say, hey, you know we know you guys are in there once a year making contact, kind of what's going on, what should the town be looking at, because they're they've got to cover the whole county with with their staff, and you know they've got probably four people that go out, um, um, six if you count the loan people too that are actually going out and meeting with businesses in the whole county. So in order to make that the, the probably the best relationship is we've got, we've got to engage them as a community versus expecting them to come to us. So I think the simple answer is let's have them at a future meeting and kind of talk about what we're doing and what they're, what they're doing um, and figure out where there might be a match or a fix. So. So, so Dave, I, I, I think Roger's point's very valid. Um, you know, we, we aren't a huge community and we don't seem to want for much, but, you know, we, we seem to, to really lag on, on commercial development and stuff. And, and if there was some sort of <clears throat> matching funds or low interest, whatever, to help mm -hmm. our businesses here, maybe we would see more of it. You know, I personally, I mean, this is talking for me and I shouldn't talk about myself, but if there was, if there was really cheap money out there or, you know, some incentives, then I would consider upping my game, you know, right now it's really not worth it, <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. And I think that's, that's part of the conversation and, you know, you gotta, you gotta see what the, what the terms are, right. I mean, what, what do they have to offer and if it's a value and it might, might not be value to you, but it might be a value to somebody down the street. So, well, my point is, is what can, what can we do as a town to not enable myself? Don't get, don't, don't misconstrue that, but enable people in my situation, you yeah. know, to, to enhance their businesses. How do we do that? Yeah. I think, I think Roger's really touched on an important point of, you know, one of the, one of the uh, mission statements of this board is how do you, how do you move things up the ladder? You know? Yeah. I mean, I, I can tell you anecdotally, um, you know, there's a lot more money at favorable terms. Um, if it's a, if it's a woman, or minority. I mean, there's a lot of effort and such placed on the whole, you know, diversity and inclusion realm out there. Um, that's not to exclude other, other, uh, you know, um, other ethnicities and such. It's just the way things are right now. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, they've got a, they, yeah, they've got a microloan program. It's pretty simple to use and. You know, that's that's for amounts, you know, up to ten, fifteen thousand dollars if somebody wanted to start a bike shop. You know, we get into those types of conversations. I mean, that's kind of the some of the capital they're looking at. Um, you know, I think and I think they can go even higher than that. And that's some of the things I've been talking to my counterpart, uh, John Capolino, who runs ECIDA now. Um, and he because he indicated there was some uh, some loosening of the regulations. So it's probably timely when we see what Vercel comes back with with respect to best practices and things we should focus on and next steps to engage them to see how they can help facilitate the financial end of things. Okay, that's a good answer. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, Dave, can I ask just about the, um, the form that was filled out? Did you say that it was the, um, the town board that gave you the list of the municipal projects? I asked, um, I asked Pete and the, and the supervisor 
um, to give me kind of the the top ten or I don't know how many were there, and that's that's what was rattled off um, and provided. So yeah, it's not something that I came up with. Might have come out of the engineering department, um, but those are the those are the major capital needs. And you know, most communities have a uh, oh, CIP. I can't think of what it stands for particularly right now, but it's you know it's usually those those um, those fixed asset infrastructure projects that you know they're they're trying to mitigate some kind of need and to be honest with you a lot of what's going to come down from the federal government this document this SEDS document is is one is is one strategy document that they look at in terms of when they're deciding which projects might get funded by the economic development administration or one of these other federal agencies so we want to make sure that those high value capital infrastructure projects are listed on there yeah, okay. we, we, that comes out of engineering. Yeah. Yeah, it came and out of engineering. Uh, the engineering. Is, oh, sorry, Bob. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, the, the list came from Lynn and engineering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the topics and priorities checklist, did the town board do that or were those our selections? That's what that's what we did. Okay. Yeah. So, Chris, Kristen, you, you and I, when we talk, you mentioned scenic woods and whether or not that project has moved forward or what's yet to be done, right? And what and how can we advance that? I mean, do you know, Pete, more about what has has a grant been written for for the, to complete that project or where are we as, with that? As far as I understand, the next phase is very detailed and very expensive um, because the next phase includes predominantly wetlands from end to end. So the, the next, the, the, the first piece was, was a pretty good sized lift. The second piece is a, is a really, really big lift. And I think it's just been a, a financial thing. And, I, and, and I'll say that I think the whole town's a little uncertain with the whole COVID thing and how we were gonna land on our feet or land on our butt, you know? So that being said, now things are starting to get a little more normal. Um, I've had a couple of conversations with the supervisor saying, can we do half of, can we split phase two into two, two phases of its own? So make it three phases so we can bite off smaller pieces and get somewhere. Um, it was a good discussion. I don't know that it went anywhere, but it was a good discussion. Let me say that. <laughs> well, I guess my question is, should that be put out the checklist of things that we want to You've got the other infrastructure projects listed. Why not that one? Well, which would uh, I, seems to me to feed into our ecotourism trail system. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of the a lot of the projects that were on that capital list are basically, I'm going to say, uh, public works projects where they're sewer replacements due to certain age, water line replacements. Um, you know, shortcomings in our infrastructure. They didn't have a whole lot on there for trails and stuff like that. That has not really been something that the town has put on their capital project list to this point. Um, There's typically a lot of uh, like greenway money and things along those lines for those types of projects too. That kind of stuff, yeah. yeah. I, will, I will say that we've had some pretty good conversations with Greenway lately. They, they, they know that we have a plan. We've showed it to them. They're, they're impressed by it. They're impressed by what we've done in a short period of time. Um, they are interested in looking at projects for us. We've talked about some stuff that came out of the LWRP with them. They're highly interested. Um, we showed them some, some, let's make what we got a little bit better by doing this, this, and this. They're interested in that. Um, I had a good conversation with some people at State Parks because there's a new uh, manager there. They're going to do some work in their trail system in there and, and upgrade it. We talked about some potential additions to it and stuff. Um, so there's pieces that going on. Scenic Woods is just another animal. Um, and I'll, I'll admit to you, Roger, it started long before I was around. And it was probably paid for long before I was around, but it was never built till I was kind of around, you know? So that's one of those works in progress, let's just say. Thank you. But Roger, I will run it back up the flagpole. 
Yeah, I like Dave's idea too. I think that we, after Dave uh, Bursell comes out with his report, this idea of sitting down with uh, people from ECIDA would be uh, an opportune time. And I think we should put that on the, put it out in the parking lot there, but uh, plan in the next few months to do something like that. Uh, you know, I, one of the things that when we had that conversation with Dan Stedman, what I felt so badly about was that poor guy is, uh, and Purcell picked up on this, that guy is so overwhelmed with just trying to take care of his motor motorboat end of things. And he really wants to do stuff on ecotourism and more kayak stuff, but he just, the poor guy doesn't have time because he's down there in the, down in the hold of the boat with a wrench. And uh, he said what he needs, he, he can't find, he says he can't find marine uh, mechanics to do that uh -huh. kind of work looking. And so Vercel said, well, are your community colleges or anybody offering programs like that? <clears throat> and Lechner point, uh, pointed out that uh, NCCC used to have a program like that, but they don't now. And I, I guess I'm wondering how we, what we have to do to help our businesses get the kind of personnel that they need. I mean, it's so sad that a guy who's enthusiastic about doing ecotourism doesn't have time to do it because he can't find help. I don't know if you have the same problem running your shop, but it just, it just seems, um, I don't know if there's anything we can do as a, a board to kind of advance that, but. Some of that's got to start, I think, before the community college. I know BOCES was doing it a little bit um, and they're, they're, you know, auto repair. Cause I mean, there's some similarities between a, a boat and a, and a vehicle in terms of the, typically the motors are based on car motors. I mean, obviously there's some, there's some different, there's some clear differences, but um, yeah. yeah, it's definitely, it's that, I mean, that's all the workforce is probably the number one issue moving forward much more so than sites and buildings. I mean, that's, that's critical, but it's just, it's, it's just aligning, uh, you know, aligning the education pipeline with, with what's available or um, needed in the marketplace. And it's just, it's, it's pretty disjointed. Roger, I, I can tell you that if I want a good employee to do what I do, I basically have to take them mm -hmm. from this, the onset and grow my own because they really don't offer a program to take, they offer automotive guys. I've hired a couple automotive guys and they, they plug a computer and the computer tells them what's wrong. You know, the, the primary problem solving skills for mechanical people now is, is almost non-existent. You know, it's one, it's one in 50, you know, and I, I, I've said a couple of times to Dr. Graham at the school, I'm just like, boy, you, if you guys aren't doing small engine anymore, you should, you know, and if, if, if you need to do it, you can't find somebody to teach it call me because I'll make time for that, you know, and, and to your point, I, I, if I had an extra hour a day, I would consider opening the bike shop at my place, oh, yeah. at my facility, right. but I don't, I don't have it. Well, I, you know? That's the kind of stuff that we need to do. It seems to me, Pete, if we're going to make ecotourism a real reality is we've got to free up people like yourself and Stedman and so forth to be able to uh, go ahead and develop these, uh, these opportunities and I, I don't know what we as a board can do, but it seems to me uh, that we need to, we need to just start doing something, perhaps meet with Graham or I, I talked to Grozio up in uh, Niagara County. He's on the legislature up there and uh, he represents people in the city of uh, Niagara Falls. And he was telling me he's been having conversations with the high school to start developing programs. Mm -hmm. We'll get some of these young people employed in these these kinds of businesses. And uh, Purcell himself told me that his own kid, he, he said, don't go, the kid isn't really interested in college. He's interested in hands-on kind mm -hmm. of stuff. It seems to me that maybe there's more of that going on now that there's young people who are interested in doing something other than going to college and taking classes. Well, they're coming I out of college. That, with these... Go ahead, Bob. I thought BOCES had a small engine repair program. Apparently they don't have that particular one for aquatic or marine stuff. Well, no, but small engine repair, yeah. you know, if, if they could help Pete, they might be able to figure out once, once they make enough money with oh, Pete, they me. could buy a boat. Yeah. The, um, you, you know, it's just, I, I can tell you that 
that stuff, I think it's going to resurge. It's going to resurge strong because people are looking at the horror stories of these six figure, you know, student loans coming out of school and people not paying right. them off till they're 50 some, you know, and that's, and there's a, there's a fairly respectable living to be made with your hands, you know, and right. I think there, there's a resurgence there. I can tell you personally, not tooting my own horn, but my wife and I sponsor a scholarship for a non college path, you know, just for people who are into to, uh, vocational stuff, because I think that's important. We, we need welders. We need people that can run equipment. We need people to dig the hole with the machine. Um, we need them as much as we need everybody else. Right. Yeah. And I guess we need people with entrepreneurial interests and skills too, to actually run a business. Yeah. Like if you're going to run a bike shop. You need somebody who's going to know how to put together a business plan and get the I was, I was a month away from it, Roger. And the guy I was going to have, that I was going to partner up with who worked for me, decided he was going to go in the service and take a different path. And he went into law enforcement. We're still very good friends, but I was close. But he just picked a different path. <laughs> I'll shut up now. I'm sorry. Just... Maybe, maybe uh, Bob Christman could help us think some of that through. I'd give Burks a call and see if he wants another store. You know, a lot of communities do those. They do educational programs. It's part of their community stuff where they they have these makers programs where where there's there's um, maybe retired guys, men or women or in there, but you know, they, they, they're they happy to have these these things where they, they teach you how to work on a, a standard lawnmower mower or how to fix, like nobody knows how to fix anything anymore and, or <laughs> any of that stuff anymore. You know what I mean? Like it's everything's by, throw it out. But a lot of communities that run things like that to teach to teach the youth how to, you know, use their hands and, and whatnot. And, I think that would, those programs, I think, would be amazing, but we yeah. want it space. So. You're they right. Keep send, they send me the emails to come read books at the elementary school, and I'm just like, send me the email that says I want to build a dune buggy with you at the tech yeah. wing, you yeah. know? Like, yeah, I wonder if there's support for, like, apprenticeship programs. Yeah. I'm telling you, there's so many things like that. Even just standard, like, trying to, you could do it even from electronics when you get, when you end up getting locked out of your computer, what's the standard things you can go through to try to figure out certain things like that? Like they have some of that, I know in, in the adult programming, but there's just so many things that you could teach standard plumbing, standard electricians, standard lawn, you know, small motor repair, standard, there's so many of those things you could do. And I think, I think, it, it would be, there's some people on this island that would be fantastic to teach them. There is a group at the high school that's always looking for apprentice opportunities for the students at the high school. Yeah, awesome. So Bob, if a young kid had a mechanical uh, aptitude and uh, we hooked him up with Dan Stedman and he knew that at the end of that curriculum that there was gonna be a job and it was gonna be it was a job where he would have a lot, he or she would have a lot of initiative to actually develop that portion of his business. And then there would be a career at the end of that. Um, yeah. Is that a... Yeah, if they were motivated to do the kind of work, absolutely. You know, if they're interested in A and you're trying to provide an apprenticeship in B, it, it won't work. But if you can match the student and, and they do have the guidance counselors do surveys of students to find out what their interests are. You may be able to match one of them with with a business. I know they work with the Chamber of Commerce to try to find uh, uh, businesses that will take a uh, high school student. So there's a lot of potential there, uh, Roger. Yeah. And I'm even thinking if Stedman has those kayak tours, he's having a hard, he was trying to get his son to do it, right? But his son um, isn't interested. He took off. So why not, why not find people who we train that be able to do that kind of stuff and see a career, potential career that Stedman well, might- My wanted, suggestion wanted, wanted to you that. would be to, to contact Cheryl Chamberlain at the high school. She'll call you back and, yes. and talk to her about your idea. She is great at finding opportunities for the kids. 
I may be Cheryl, I may, Cheryl Chamberlain. I may be seeing Cheryl tomorrow at a party. There I'll, you go. Uh, I'll, I'll ask her for you, Roger. Okay. Is she involved with, um, I believe there's like a DECA program at the yes, high school. She runs it. Yeah, that's she okay. has for years. Gotcha. That's the one. I've worked with her on chamber event things with the kids. Yeah. She's great with that stuff. Point being though, in, in the whole realm of things, there's a lot of things that we can do on a, on the town local level that just a matter of putting an outline out there and trying to get them implemented and find space to do them. I think there's a lot of people that would raise their hand if we had better, not better, but other program opportunities. Yeah. Well, the only thing I'm looking at is Vercel said we need an infrastructure. If we're going to equal tourism, you've got to build an infrastructure to make that work. So you've got to have people trained for jobs that are going to, <coughs> seems to me, to feed into that. And I'll shut up there with this point, Bob. <laughs> Has anybody got any anything else they want to add in the round table? Could I just ask what happened with the tree ordinance Monday night? That's an excellent question. <laughs> I, I've, I haven't heard anything. We well, had a public hearing and closed it. And uh, because I asked what they wanted to do, and they said, well, we'd like to petition for lead agency to the town of Grand Island. Okay, it makes sense, as long as you got a cooked plan. And I would have expected to refer to several boards, including yours, and uh, that wasn't what they wanted to do. So I really don't know. Um, the, the only board that's really had a, a touchy-feely thing with it has been conservation, which is... Yeah. Uh, and. I'm not, I don't particularly think the law's anywhere near where it needs to be before we start to talk about enacting it. So to me, it's just kind of, I don't know what's going on with it. I really don't. Well, it, it's probably going to be brought up at your next workshop, right? Of course it will. And we'll, try and, <laughs> and we'll try and vote on an unvetted law. Yep. Yeah. That's, a, that's an ordinance that for like almost four or five years now, between some of the other things I've been on or just following it in self-interest, um, I've really tried to keep a close eye on. Um, I did send a separate notice to the town board mm -hmm. speaking on, on myself. Um, my biggest problem with that is the, the bias maybe of a board when it comes to economic development and other things that are in that, but you know, mine, there's so many holes in that, that, that ordinance that's there, that that's a yep. real problem. And yep. my, my strongest position right now is that I don't want to pass a law just to have a new chapter in the code book. We need, mm -hmm. it needs to be right if that's something that we are going to do. And, and right now it looks like that they just want to get it on there, which, you know, maybe my views aren't the right views, but I do think there's something to be said when it's gone to all the advisory boards and every advisor board has turned it down unanimously, except a few members on the conservation board. That includes planning and people that read all the, you know, that, that, that decipher what, these, what the, the code book says or doesn't say. So, you know, and I've talked to some people in engineering and building about that too. I mean, there's some current concerns there. So I, I just really want them to really look at it. And there's so many holes. Well, I mean, just to ask, is this being brought forth by the conservation board, or is this being brought forth by Mr. Madigan? That's a really good question. <laughs> well, I'll say, I say it's Mike Madigan on the end because of the voting. So if you watch the conservation boards, the conservation board did not bring this up to their agenda. Mike brought it to the agenda and Mike reviewed what he re somewhat rewrote and they were they agreed with it. Now I understand the frustration on one level that these the that board has spent a lot of time and in, and in, in, in trying to work something out. But there's if you keep working at something work so it, it, it's not going anywhere or changing. And the other problem was is that you know there was other groups, Grand Island groups or even the conservation board that didn't have the newest written ordinance that they didn't even have it in their hand to speak of um, at, the, at that meeting. So 
they were talking about things that they hadn't even read yet or had changed since the point that it was being brought up. So to me, that's another, you know, another concern. I don't know. And a five back, a five year look back, you know, where do you, you it's touchy, you know, I'm, I very much want, I believe in green space and that, but I also believe that, you know, there's, there's, there's zoning for, we've zoned things for, for a certain reason and the design standards is just something that I'm trying to look into and research now on how design, having maybe more stringent design standards are truly making those on, in, in, in our like landscape plans that these developers actually follow through what they were, were supposed to do and whatnot. But there's a, regardless of what my opinion is, it's there's a lot of holes that can be had there. And that is what's super concerning to me, you know, and there's not that much property left Pete, for, for this. Pete, um, when, when David showed the picture of the Ryan development with no street trees, mm -hmm. the sarcastic, part of me wanted to say, well, if the tree ordinance got put together then and passed, then the highway department would have to be out there planting those trees. Yeah. Well, yeah. the design standards are supposed to be that the develop, some of these developers are supposed to have trees and they never have been put in. But, you know, there's, that's be my other argument is we can put all the laws in the book, but if we can't enforce them and we don't have the manpower to do this, who's going to go out and and check the trees and keep the inventory and say what's healthy, what's not healthy, what's proper, what's not proper. Like to me, there's just so many of those questions. So we could put the law in the book, but who's where are we going? And then is it fair if if you've invested in so much property? I mean, one of our developers on the island, I'm just saying this because we know his name, Mazer, he put he develops a lot of property on the island. With his investments, is it is it right for us now to put a couple residents on the projects of his multi-million dollar investments. I don't know if that's the right way to go about doing it. That's what all the safe holds are, I believe, that our state, federal, or you know, local, and our codes for. Can we do more with tree care and conservation and, and, and incentive for keeping it more green and stuff like that? I think so, but we've never really no one never wants to talk about that option. I know mm -hmm. I sore subject or not sore subject, invested subject that I have. It's a um, it's a I, difficult subject, Jen, because there's it's you're you're basically trying to pay, base an opinion on an opinion, which is another opinion. So it's yeah, just really. like you know, so you 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 lay this to code enforcement and say here, enforce this, they're gonna be like, What? What do you yeah. want us to do? You know. So what it's about how trees and rat and mar like what do you want us to do with this? Yeah, right. So that's and that's that's where I, I'm struggling with it. I, I don't I don't disagree with green space, I don't disagree with conservation by right. any means. But how do we do this? And and you could say anything you want, but how do you do it? You know, and Engineer, just, that's a great question to ask and a great conversation. So the I think sort of the issue is we're not being permitted to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Right. How dare nobody, you ask? Nobody wants to see trees or clear cutting or anything, but the, right. even the conversation has been made that this ordinance would not stop clear cutting. It's just, no. he was specifically stated multiple times, it will slow, us, slow it down and basically make them halt till we figure out what we want to do. We have 30 days or whatever, but regardless, it's not going to stop development. And so, so why, what's the point then? Isn't so in, in development, time is money. So right. the more you sell them, the more it costs them, and the less Absolutely. they're going to do for their project. You know, Absolutely. so it seems counterproductive. I, I, I understand your point. Yeah. So Pete, South Point, which seems to be the example right now that's being lifted up as an example of clear cutting, that's designated commercial property, right? And so if you're going to develop that property, you got to have the ability to clear land so you can put your buildings on it, right? Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me sometimes that our people who say we're all for saving trees aren't discriminating against, between those parcels of property, which are the major parcels of property on the island that are going to be continued to be tree laden. But uh, you got to take down some trees to do commercial development. 
and you get a couple of uh, self-appointed, oh, I better be careful what I say. It's just, but you know what I'm saying? You get people who say, I'm the expert on this. This is the way it's got to go. Then you get somebody putting the ordinance before you. And then the next thing you know, the town board's voting on it. And it's just not done in a deliberative and thoughtful no. fashion. It's just being- Okay. All right. Let me, let me say something. I think we put together a very good recommendation letter to the town. We yes, sent it. Yes. Yeah, Martha, Martha <laughs> read it in the public meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, Pete's got a copy. We gave it to, to the supervisor. I think what, what we said was this really ought to be part of the, the planning process. And it ought to be, I mean, some rules need to be written. But the town planning board needs to do it. Those are the people that have every right to look at the town, look at the plot plan and, and to comment about it. And some rules to prevent the clear cutting and before they even get to it is what we said needs to be done. But there are five of you and you guys are gonna end up voting hopefully not voting for it, but we've done what we can do. And so, so Scott. Bob, to your, go ahead. To, to your point, the planning board is the one who basically is in charge of, I guess, facilitating it once the ink is dry. But as far as writing scratch laws, that is not really the wheelhouse of the planning board. That right. is more or less why we have a long range planning committee is to kind of bring this stuff forth. You know, it, start, it normally starts there and then it fingers out to the other boards through the long range plan because every board is represented. Then it comes back and it's a much better way to cook, you know, a, a law like this because it's now it's already touched every board. And when they see it, it's got their pieces already in it and it makes more sense. Mm -hmm. When you start, when you start cooking it from one board that's outside the realm of, of that, then you're trying to bring it back the other way. It's just, it's real problematic. And you just, it's just, it's just, it's drama, you know? Well, this uh, all originated too, because of the tree USA designation and it did. having to it have did. something out of that, but it, then it turned into, well, we can use this as we can build on this and make this stronger or whatnot to mm -hmm. the safe tree cutting, you know, clear cutting or whatnot, which it's still not, but the tree USA, doesn't need to be this difficult. We could have gotten that designation by now and we could have made strides or in that or whatever. Anyways, I, I listen, I, I give all the credit to people that sit on these boards. This is all of our free time and, and I don't want it down. I don't have a problem with the conservation board. I have a problem with- Nor do I, council. nor do I. Oh, right, Pete. Yeah. I have a problem with the councilman and the way he goes, he's going around about doing this and it's being pushed through. And I have another, another council person who's leaving in two weeks, but she doesn't even, and I get committees, can things can get killed, killed in the committee and go over and over again, you know, on, on things. But another one that doesn't want to have any discussion about this anymore or, or whatnot and said, no, we're done talking committee, we're doing this. So that's disconcerting, but that's near here and there now. But uh, I'll things. say one more statement, you know, um, South Point, it's a big piece of property. It's huge. I walked it. It's a lot of acres. They, they are, they've cleared or they're clearing or developing 39% of that lot um, total of the total acreage. Now, that seems you look at it and you're like, there's so much cut. But then I come to my home, which is a five acre lot, and I have two acres cleared, and I am exactly the same as them. You, you, you do the percentages. I have 40% of my lot cleared yeah. and nobody drives by my house and says, Oh my God, look at the destruction, you know, but it's just a bigger animal. So it just seems right. bigger. But Pete, let's go back and let's go on the boards that approve this instead of we're going through history over and over again, but yeah. it's, it's done. So we're looking yeah. at variances and whatnot, whatnot mm -hmm. now that need to be had. It has nothing to do with anybody that's sitting on any boards right now. Right. And whatnot. It's done. They're not, you know, go back on that. So I don't know. I'd rather right. concentrate on making their plan the best it can be yes. instead of beating them to the ground. Yes. Yes. And, and I think you've got three weeks that you have to just keep persisting because this would be better done next year. Roger that. Roger. 
All right, anything else other than the tree ordinance? Do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 See you guys in January. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Yeah, happy happy New Year. Holiday.